Hello, everyone. Hello, fellow space cadets and those whom I hope to convert to a space cadet today. I'm coming to you from the MIT Media Lab as the founder and lead of the Space Exploration Initiative. The Media Lab, for those who may not be familiar, is an interdisciplinary, corporate-funded R&D lab at MIT, the Massachusetts Institute for Technology. The Media Lab is a special place because it is anti-disciplinary or highly, highly interdisciplinary. There are 26 different research groups that span the gamut from synthetic neurobiology, so leading cutting-edge biology, to AI, data science, art and architecture, and now space and design. The Space Exploration Initiative at MIT Media Lab is meant to be a launch pad across all of these different disciplines. And the reason that's special is that traditionally space was the domain just for aerospace engineers, physicists, maybe a couple biologists. But we have a vision that we can enable artists and philosophers and ethnographers and social activists, in addition to scientists and engineers, to deploy their research and their design dreams for the future of space exploration and sci-fi prototyping. Here's our mission. I'm gonna tell you a little bit first about why it's possible to do this now. What's new and changing about the space industry. So the first thing is that the costs are dropping and that makes it vastly more accessible than it ever has been before. It used to cost hundreds of millions of dollars to put a satellite into orbit and the satellites would be about the size of this room from me back to the back wall. So giant infrastructure being in orbit. We're now seeing hundreds of millions of dollars coming down to, to launch a CubeSat, which is something about this big, a fully functional satellite miniature, only a few thousand dollars. And that's transforming the industry and the ability of people like ourselves to be able to launch our own creative ideas into space. The next thing that we're thinking about is if Jeff Bezos, you know, tech billionaire, founder of Amazon, Elon Musk, founder of SpaceX, NASA, ESA, these institutions are building the rockets to get us there right now, there being Mars, Moon, beyond. But what is the human lived experience once we are there? What are the tools, the technologies, the experiences that will delight and hopefully empower humanity as we go forward? And who are the designers, who are the people getting to make the choices for the future of space? These are the questions that we're trying to answer at the Space Initiative. To that point, our mission is to actively design, build, and deploy the technologies of a sci-fi space future. So we're thinking very far out while fundamentally and at the same time democratizing access to space, trying to broaden the swath of humanity that's able to be engaged in the future of designing space exploration. To tell you about how this is possible, if you want a multifaceted vision for the future of space, you need a multifaceted team. This is just a small selection of the 50 students, graduate students, staff, and faculty that make this studio, this space studio, a reality. I founded the group in 2016 and feel incredibly privileged to lead this effort where I have a biologist sitting right next to an artist who's exhibited in MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, where we have a scientist like myself sitting right next to a designer or an ethnographer thinking about musical instruments for the future of space. So while I started my career training to be a physicist and the work that I do, my personal research is still in aerospace structures designing the future of space habitats, I've come to realize it is critical to have this diversity of perspectives in a team designing something as broad as humanity's future in space. I'll now break down our mission into three tenants, so you'll see three versions of this slide, and then give you a concrete research example out of our portfolio to give you a sense of how we're actually realizing these philosophies in reality. So our first goal, democratizing access to space exploration. Next year will be the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, and although I personally was not there, what people of that generation will tell you is that when the moon landing happened, when Sputnik happened, all of these early stage space developments, people looked up in the sky and thought that in their lifetime they would get to go. They're looking up and thinking that they will get to participate in the future of space. Since then, we've taken a rather winding route to where we are now, but we are once again at the cusp of interplanetary civilization. And so we're trying to think about how do you once again empower this generation and future generations to be part of space? We do it in two ways. One is our research portfolio focuses on a few projects that they themselves engage many, many different people, give people direct access to space. So I'll give you one concrete example of that. The second way is through STEM and STEAM educational outreach opportunities. So STEM and STEAM, what that means to us in the States is science, technology, education, and mathematics. But what we love now is this integration of art in that. So science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. 
The idea is to teach young people, these STEAM or STEM educational outreach programs, how to become the next generation of space tinkerers, space designers, space artists, space explorers, and give them the technical grounding early on to be able to do that. So example of the first project. This is known as Blockset Constellation Algorithms. You may be aware of this notion of constellations of small satellites in orbit. So companies like SpaceX and OneWeb are proposing to put satellite hardware, so these are um, pieces of hardware that take measurements or orbit the Earth around in low Earth orbit. The purpose, tangentially, initially, is to provide broadband to the surface of the Earth. However, we have a vision that instead of these constellations always being owned and managed by a single company or a single entity, what if they were broadly available to all of us? So just like renting time on a cloud computing cluster, which many of us are now familiar with, you can just rent time on Amazon's hardware on Earth, what if any of us could post a request to a satellite and have our own dreams and interests executed on that satellite? To give you a couple examples of what could be done, you could take an image of your hometown, you could take an image of your favorite sector of the stars, you could teach your child how to take a climate measurement on the limb of the atmosphere, to be able to enable this, we're looking at two technologies. One is distributed ledger technology. Having worked in the blockchain field for a number of years before working in space, I'm careful to avoid blockchain as a fad term. Really what we need here is a ledger to allow many, many different requests from around the world to be posted to a ledger, be tracked, and then be executed. So you can say, hey, I want to take a picture of my hometown today. I want to pick a picture of the stars tomorrow. And then a layer of machine learning to do smart orchestration. So if you get five kids that want to image their hometown and six other different kids who want to do climate science measurements, but they all come in mismatched and jumbled, you want to batch those tasks together for the most efficient use of the hardware in orbit. Our hope is that this won't be just a single few satellites, but actually a constellation of maybe hundreds to be able to facilitate a really large portion of our global population to start thinking about space and engaging. An example of our STEM outreach efforts, this is the Climate CubeSat co-building program. The goal here is to teach young students how to build a CubeSat. So as I mentioned before earlier, CubeSats are as small as 10 centimeters on a side. What the students are doing in this program with us is owning the entire life cycle of a spacecraft build. That means everything from the design of the hardware, to the building, to the testing, to launching a CubeSat, and then taking data from it when it arrives up in orbit. We are intentionally theming this around climate science because we want to empower a new generation to have ownership over data about the health of their planet. Crowdsourced citizen science is something that we think will continue and grow to be more and more important. While we're piloting this right now with 20 local students in Boston, we're thinking from the very beginning about how do we scale this nationally and internationally? How can this become an educational program that could be as common as machine shop or wood shop or biology in schools around the globe? And the way we're approaching it is through Instructables. So some of you may be familiar with this notion of online follow-through steps that are very simple. We're basically publishing an Instructables set of instructions for the future of building CubeSats, along with an online community that provides technical mentorship and a number of resources and examples that this community can tap into as community groups, maker spaces, libraries, public libraries around the world join on to this program. Mission tenant number two. How do we revolutionize the future of space exploration while still profoundly benefiting life on Earth? So to speak to the first part, we hope that this is a bold and not an arrogant goal. We think it's bold because there's something special about being able to do this work at the Media Lab. It's a place where we're not constrained by making a profit or trying to meet a bottom line, and we're also not constrained by typical academic grants. So this gives us the freedom to think about the futuristic, risky, unexpected, perhaps provocative research for the future of exploration. At the same time, there's a common trope, there's a common set of stories in science fiction about something horrible happens to the Earth, and that's why we do space exploration. That's why we have to escape the Earth. If you think of stories like Blade Runner, there's a dystopian setting on the Earth, or Armageddon, where an asteroid's about to come and destroy the Earth. That is not our philosophy. That's not why we're pursuing space exploration. The Earth is the best home we will ever have. Yes, we're finding exoplanets around other stars, but there is nowhere else where human life has co-evolved for hundreds of thousands of years. That means that this is not a story about abandoning the Earth, but about trying to make a better vision for humanity wherever we are on Earth and beyond. And one beautiful aspect of space, it's a resource-constrained environment. It's a very rigorous domain to be able to build things that will function correctly. 
that means that we have analogs on Earth that are very useful to take space exploration technologies and bring them back down to benefit Earth populations. Other resource constrained environments on Earth, think refugee camps, nomadic peoples, areas hit by natural disasters. There's a long history of NASA and ESA technologies developed for space, like water purification, LASIK, that became the technology behind LASIK eye surgery, being developed for the rigors of space and coming back down to benefit life on Earth. And so this is a tenant that we try to take forward in all of our work, thinking about how our space exploration prototyping can do double duty as benefiting human life here on the planet. To give you two examples, this is something where we're looking at how do you revolutionize the future of space exploration, so the first part of that sentence. The International Space Station is incredibly complicated to build and deploy. This is the space station that's currently in orbit around the Earth. It's an international effort. And yet, with the budding and coming wave of space tourism, thousands potentially of humans in orbit around the Earth, that type of architecture doesn't scale. We can't have astronauts manually bolting things in for thousands of people to make their habitats. This is a proposal for self-assembling space architecture. The idea is you take a certain volume, a certain structure that you would like to build in space, and you break it down, you tessellate it into a number of different tiles that when those tiles are released separately in space, floating in zero gravity in orbit around the Earth, the tiles are able to, with the ability of magnets, the enhancement of magnets on their edges, passively come together and click, 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 self-assemble into the shape that you're interested in. So this is a small scale model, but imagine something 10, 20 uh, meters in diameter being self-assembled in this way. Another way to think about it is IKEA furniture or IKEA architecture for the future of space. Because these tiles are self-assembling, they're able to be taken apart, packed flat in a rocket, and deployed into their larger volume only once they are in orbit. This allows us to no longer be constrained by the volume of the rocket, the ride to orbit, when you actually want to deploy much larger architecture. And as an important side note to this project, yes, the key here is deploying in space. Zero gravity, floating is what allows the tiles to, without any friction or air drag, come together so beautifully. But this could be a model for modular, cheap architecture for resource-constrained environments on the Earth, perhaps for refugee camps, for areas where you need to spin up shelter very quickly. And we are looking at this project in both contexts. Now, one of my favorite things to talk about on the benefiting life on Earth is thinking about the stories that we embed in our future and what it means to have a narrative for space exploration. Many of you in the audience may be familiar with the Homeric epics, the Odyssey and the Iliad, these stories that are often um, said to be crucial to Western culture. They defined what it meant for Odysseus to take a voyage. It defined what it meant for that culture around the Mediterranean to do something brave, cunning, values both good and bad. What is our new global humanity-wide vision for the future of space exploration? What does it mean for humans to take a long duration space voyage? We have the proto early versions of what this might mean. If you look at sci-fi from the mid 20th century, Isaac Asimov, Robert Heinlein, and Neil Stevenson more modernly. And yet, as fantastic as those stories are, they're incomplete. We need more female voices in the future of designing space exploration. We need more voices outside of just the 1% of the world, the top 1% or 2% of the world's countries, very highly developed nations that are typically the only ones thinking about how to design for space. So when we come to this realization and we say, where else can we learn about deep human meaning for what it means to be part of the cosmos? And we're beginning to look back at indigenous cultures. So indigenous peoples around the earth are often defined as the native peoples or the first peoples of an area, and they often have really rich cosmologies. A cosmology is an origin myth or a narrative that often involves the stars, often for how their culture was created. And we have two key takeaways about what we can learn from indigenous cultures in this space context. The first is that they have a beautiful perspective for their place and meaning in the cosmos. So in modern Western society, we often think of space as this very far out, empty void. You have to leave here and go out into it. For many indigenous cultures, we are in it. You're in it right now. You're part of the cosmos. So instead of looking up at the skies and feeling insignificant, like, oh, I'm part of this tiny thing and I'm, there's so much grander things outside beyond me, you get to have a sense, depending on your, where you come from, of either spirituality or awe of being part of something bigger and grander than yourself. And so there's a certain beauty in that indigenous culture's approach to cosmology that we're trying to, to think about in the future of our work. And the second takeaway is that these cultures often have deep and surprisingly accurate embedded knowledge. 
we don't always give them credit for it because it's not scientific knowledge. And I'll give you a concrete example of yet how accurate and interesting their knowledge can be. The painting that you're seeing on the slides is from the Loricha people of Central Australia. They have an origin story that life was brought to Earth on meteorites. And the fantastic thing is they might not be wrong. NASA research from the early 2000s up until today are actively anal analyzing amino acids that had been found on meteorites that came far away from the Earth and landed on the surface. Amino acids are the building blocks of DNA. They're the building blocks of life. And there's something beautiful about the fact that a culture hundreds of years ago, maybe even a th over a thousand years ago, developed a notion of how life might have come to the Earth that could be absolutely scientifically correct. And this inspires us to look for more of those stories and to continue finding ways for indigenous cultures and their lessons and their cosmologies to influence how we are designing the future of space exploration. Mission tenant number three, and the last one. Why are we doing this at the Media Lab? Why is it a special place to do it here? It's once again about that team. It's about uniting engineers, scientists, artists, and designers. And I usually like to add philosophers and ethnographers and social activists. All, everybody, we need all of these different perspectives to be able to really prototype a richly envisioned future for space exploration. I'll give you two examples for this one. The first is that at the lab, we have a relatively famous Argentinian musician who's working with a local designer and an ethnographer to design the, one of the first musical instruments meant for zero gravity, so it can only be played in zero gravity. This doesn't mean bringing a flute or a guitar up to the International Space Station and playing it, but thinking about the aesthetics and the meaning of what will human culture be like when we're on a five-year journey to Mars, when we're on a 50 or 1,000-year journey with much enhanced propulsion technology to Alpha Centauri. What does that mean? What does that look like? To give you a sense of the f some of the farthest out research that we're doing really on the sci-fi level, I want to tell you a little bit about tardigrades. Has anyone in the audience heard of these little creatures before, tardigrades, also known as water bears? Awesome. So they're affectionately known as water bears because they have this kind of anthropogenic uh, face on them. The reason that they're special is that they are incredibly resilient to extremes of temperature, to being irradiated, to being desiccated. So basically, they can survive in a vacuum and come back to another environment and be reanimated. What allows them to do this is a property called cryptobiosis. It's a genetic property. So one of our labs at the Media Lab Space Initiative is looking at how do you take this genetic property of cryptobiosis and reverse engineer it into other organisms. The idea is to fundamentally flip the design paradigm for Earth-based organisms in space. Traditionally, we always assume that if an Earth-based organism, primarily a human, is going to go out and explore space, you have to be in a life support bubble. You have to be in a little environmental bubble like the Earth. With this technology, could we instead make humans more fundamentally space tolerant? Now, there are tons of ethical questions that we will have to answer and think about along the way. And realistically, we're going to be looking at this at many other smaller organisms long before we get to humans. This might be a 50 or 100 year vision, but it gives you an example of how we're thinking really far out about the future of human life in space. To give you a sense of the sampling of projects, so I've given you a few vignettes along the way. If you'd like to reach out, if you think as a designer or a scientist or a company rep that you have something to add to the future of space exploration, this is just to give you a sense of you belong. We'd love to hear from you. Um, it's a really wide range of different projects that we pursue. You're not a real space program if you're not launching into space. So these are the ways in which we deploy our projects, our prototypes. We just completed a zero gravity flight in the fall, for which you'll see a video momentarily. To explain the zero gravity flight briefly, they're affectionately known as the vomit comet because the plane, instead of flying level as planes usually do, flies steeply upward, pitches over and flies steeply down, we're like almost right towards the ground, and then repeats that motion 30 times. So it's like a roller coaster in the sky, at the top of which, the top of those parabolas, you get 20 to 30 beautiful seconds of nearly perfect microgravity. So it's one of the few simulation opportunities for zero gravity while you're still on the surface of the Earth. Within the next six months, so by the end of this year, we're very fortunate to be launching with Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos' space company, for six payloads on his suborbital rocket, New Shepard. And then within about a year and a half from now, we're looking at opportunities to already deploy technologies on the International Space Station and beyond. 
Beyond the Cradle is an event, a very special event that we hold at the Media Lab each year now to celebrate the future of space exploration. And what we do is we bring the leading CEOs from all the top space companies internationally, we bring space scientists and academicians, but we also bring Hollywood producers and sci-fi authors and artists and writers to try and co-design the future together, not just at this event, but to build a community. And what I wanted to say to you all today is that you also can be the stewards, the stewards of the final frontier, the stewards of space. And we'd love to hear from you. So if you think you might be interested, please reach out, talk to us, or even just in your own design context, think about how your work might someday be relevant to space. And now I'll leave you with a video where you can see some of the technologies being deployed in that zero gravity flight. Thank you.